Welcome to the second tutorial. Hopefully I haven't scared you off yet. What we'll be covering is the toolbox, the most important set of icons for this game. This is the collection of modules where you can terraform, set your environment, build your path layout, plop some structures, plant trees and shrubs, build roller coasters, design flat rides, place lights, create custom buildings, populate with particle effects, add custom audio, select and tweak animations, and control the water table. I won't cover every one of these in this tutorial, but I'll be sure to cover the most essential ones. Roller coasters, expanded flat rides, animation, audio, and particles will be for additional tutorials in the future. We're going to start with Paths, a very powerful module that immediately illustrates Theme Park Studios' exclusion of a rigid grid system. To build onto the existing path, click on the hammer icon. My cursor now becomes the path. Right now it is set on grid snaps, but if I disable that button, I have the freedom to move it wherever I please. If I want to change the direction of the path on the fly, all I have to do is click Alt and move my mouse in the direction where I want the path to go. So if I move my mouse to the right, the path orients to the right. If I move it to the left, it orients left, and so forth and so on. It uses all of the north, south, east, and west coordinates. So I set my first piece, and I'll fiddle with it. Make another U-turn here, and close it off. Another thing I can do is if I press the control button and drag, I can scale the path width on the fly as well. Let's say I want to connect these two paths with another path. Well, I can do that. If you open up the path presets, you can see a number of predefined path pieces. Basic path, path with fence, path with sidewalk, even simple fences and walls. But for now, I'll just use the basic path. When I'm laying down the first path piece, if I press the control button and mouse over to an existing path, that first node will stick to and orient itself to the original path. So I'm going to select, and again I get to set my next path piece. If I do this again, pressing control and mousing over, I can connect the path piece like I wanted. To finish, I'll just grab the nodes and pull them to get rid of any unsightly edges. If I want to change any properties on these paths, this is another really easy thing to do. I've selected a path node, and now I'm going to go to properties, which is this little button right here. In here, I can add a fence on this side, I can add a fence on the other side, I can add a sidewalk on both sides, and what I find useful is if I take sidewalks and bring them down to the lowest size, uh, I create path curbs. Just because it says sidewalk doesn't mean you can't use it for something else. Continuing on, if I open up the Objects tab in the Path module, I can add trees automatically in a pattern. Say I want to add this tulip tree. I certainly can. It immediately comes up. Well, right now it's a little bit too much for my taste. So what I'm going to do is highlight one of the tulip tree mediums in the box and delete. Then I'm going to click on the remaining tulip tree, change my distance until I like it, mm, increase it so I don't have so many trees. And then I'll change my separation, which pushes the trees out from the path, so that when I landscape, if ever I need to change my path, the landscape goes with it. This is a really cool feature, and I think you'll find many uses for. Besides just trees, you can add path junk, street lamps. Again, if it's too much, you can simply delete one side and increase the separation and distance until you like it. I can randomly scale them, and I can give them random directions, but for this piece, I won't. You should know you're not tied down to auto object generation mode though. You can still go into the path objects library and select whatever you want and plop them one at a time. So you still have the option to handcraft your park. But this object generation method is going to save you a ton of time when assets start becoming more available and you're sifting through dozens and dozens of different lampposts. Or even litter. I mean you could even generate litter on your paths if you felt so inclined. I don't know why you'd want to, but the option is still there. The next thing I'll show you, which fits in nicely here, are the materials. So we're going to change the material on this path. If you open the materials tab and select the first library, you can see a variety of bricks and masonry. To get this onto the path, it's pretty dang easy. You click on whatever texture you want. Once you see the cursor change to the rainbow, you can hover over 
and whatever is in the green bounding box is what will change. All the textures change by separation of the node. So this whole road is one piece, and this whole road is one piece. But I'm going to change this middle section, and I have a brand new texture. Right now it is fighting because of the overlap, but I can easily fix that by making the other road the same texture. So now that we have the basics of path creation and path manipulation down, I decided to open up my little test park to show you terrain. This seemed like a good jumping off point. If I open the terrain module, you can see I have a number of options. Landscape terrain swatches will cover the entire map, and dynamic terrain swatches will only cover a portion of the map. So you can actually make this smaller by using control and your left mouse button, or you can rotate it using alt and left mouse button. But if I'm feeling a little lazy, I can go to any of the landscape maps which cover the whole park, and I can click until I'm happy with the result. Now I have no idea what this landscape was going to do, and now I do. It's covered up some of my map, but I'm just going to use Level Flatten to bring back some of the park. Mm, I'll, I'll make this much smaller. Y you really don't know what these things are going to do until you try them out. That's part of the fun. But you'll see things are not moving with the terrain, and that was a decision that was made to keep assets from breaking apart, especially complicated ones. Now you'll notice all of the objects did not go over the terrain when I changed it, and that is because of a tool called Terrain Binding, which are these three buttons right here. And I'll show you what these do right now. So on this little hill I've created, which is kind of a big hill now, but that's okay, I'm going to go into my path module and choose path objects, and I'm going to select this pad. It's a round pad, and it's for rides or basically anything you'd want a pad for. What makes this unique is that it actually tiles the texture appropriately, so you don't have enormous textures based on how big the piece is. It all stays as it should. And so if I set this down, you can see that it's floating above the terrain. It's not really connected to anything. But if I go to this button, right now it's on disable, go to this button and click clear and raise, what this will do is bind this pad to the terrain and create a brand new terrain for me. I can even use this piece now to level out other parts of this terrain. I could create an entire upper level up here, right behind the coaster. So I've just quickly terraformed without having to use the terraformer. The other button, clear, will still let you raise the piece, but if you go down, you will start to clear the land. And once again, this can be very useful for terraforming making smaller, precise gouges into the mountainside here, or simply just to level out a complicated plane so you can build your park. These pads also have a little added functionality. If I go to Path Libraries and open up a basic path, you know, to create a queue or something, I can definitely do that. If I press Control and head towards the pad, it attaches to it, just like the other path. These have little stickers at the end that your path can grab onto. The next thing to go over is the architectural library, which is just a series of pre-made structures. In this park alone I've got about five and one custom structure. They're your typical stalls that you'd find in any other theme park game, but they also have some added functionality. Again, if you press control, when you run across a path, the building snaps to and orients itself to the path. If I click it, select it and move it into position, the game's done the hard work for me. I don't need to manually position it, I just need to move it closer to the path. And there is Burger Town, in my little hodgepodge of a park right now. One thing I jumped over was the environment tab, and it starts off with these nice presets. You can choose sunset, which it's on right now, blue sky one with the sky box, or Night Sky 2 with the Hemisphere, etc. Skybox just means it has six sides to the environment, rather than a giant dome. But what is especially cool once again, is that you can completely change this. You can change your diffuse color, which is your sunlight color, and your ambient color, which is your fill color. You can choose to have it on at night, even though it's daytime, perfect for late sunset or stormy days. 
you can increase or decrease the distance of your fog if you want a really foggy scene or you want things to fall off a lot faster. You can turn off fog if it helps your performance. And you can also change the vector of the light, which is like moving the position of the sun. And if you really feel up to it, you can create your own textures. This will be something I'll cover in future tutorials. So I'm going to switch over to night. You see I already have some lighting in here. I'll uh, open it up and change the ambient to really dark. And there we go. And I'll change the diffuse to... Let's go a little darker. There. So I just improved my night scene with two clicks. And if I like it enough, I could export this so that I have it on hand every time I play. So this building has no light. You can see it's very dark. So I'll show you that next. If you click on the light module, you get, once again, a bunch of presets. So I'm going to choose this purple Omni. And if I click it, I instantly have light. It's purple light, and that's what I'm going to change right now. If I click the properties button, which should always look the same, I can change the color. I can even go as far as custom color. So let's use this brown. Yeah, that kind of works. I can change the size of the light using attenuation. So I can have it light up the first story, or I can intensify it to reach above. You can also change the type of light. Right now there are two, an Omni HD and an Omni Fast. The difference is that one takes a lot less time, Fast Omni, and doesn't calculate the geometry, just the proximity. And the other does actually look at how the light should affect the model. HD Omnis are more power hungry, so use them sparingly. So if I mess with this HD Omni, and I turn up the attenuation, you can see the light starting to affect the burger on top. So it's a lot more defined of a light, but if you have too many of those in any one park, you could run into some trouble. For now, I like the fast Omni. It floods in a very uniform way. The next things I want to show you have to do with workflow, and they are the bolt button, the selection lock button, and the move to selected button. If I select something that I don't ever want to be changed again, or if I want to lock it in place for now, all I have to do is hit this bolt button, and it should not, I should no longer be able to, exactly. See the path didn't move, but I picked up a tree instead. I should be able to select it, but I can't move it no matter how hard I try. This is extremely helpful when you start getting into more complex scenes within your park. You can do this for landscape too. If I click on this tree and add to my selection using Control, Alt, and Click, I can pick up multiple trees. So I'm going to add all these trees on Main Street and click the bolt button, and now they cannot move. So I can't accidentally select them and move them to another part of the park. This is such an important button and one I think you'll be using like second nature. Another really important tool is the selection lock tool. And the reason it is so important is because when you start doing these multiple selections like I showed you, so if I click Control alt and pick up these two trees, if I go to move all three of these right now, I'm only going to pick up one. So I'm going to hit the space bar, which is a hotkey for selection lock, or I can press the button. Now I've completely locked the selection. It goes where I go, it goes where my mouse goes, and I don't lose it. I can even try to click off and I won't lose it. Until I hit spacebar again to toggle selection lock off and click outside the bound box, the selection will remain. And the last workflow tool is move to selected, which is just an easy tool you may have seen in other games. If I click the ticket window building and I press move to selected, boom, here I am. So instead of having to click and claw back and forth, I could be over at the ticket building, click the ferris wheel, hit move to select it, and there I am, ready to work. It might shave off seconds, it might even shave off minutes over time. And there you have it! You are now ready to jump in and play Theme Park Studio. I hope you found this getting started tutorial useful. The next series will dive deeper into the many customization options this game allows and encourages. Until next time, happy building!